All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Preach the word, be urgent in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure the sound doctrine, but having itching ears will heap unto themselves teachers after their own lusts, and will turn aside from the truth and turn into fables. 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4. As we study tonight in uh, Acts chapter 6 and verse number 11. Oops, I'm in the wrong lesson. As we, uh, I, I thought something was wrong. As we go in Acts 6 and verse number 11, uh, we're going to uh, be talking still about Stephen. And we're going to see the opposition that, uh, that Stephen faced. We'll see if that works. And we'll see the opposition that they faced. And they'll see, you'll see that Stephen, an inspired preacher, would face the same opposition that other inspired men would in the first century. They would face uh, these individuals that, that were trying their very best to undo the truth that Stephen was preaching. You'll see, uh, we'll, we'll see this as we get further into it. But notice again, the obligation is still there to preach the word. The obligation is to preach the gospel and only the gospel, not opinions. The obligation is to do so whether folks want to hear it or not. And that's exactly what Stephen will do. And that's what these other inspired men will do. And it's the same thing that we have to do. We're not inspired men today, but we preach an inspired gospel when we simply proclaim the truth. Mm -hmm. So that's our obligation and that's what we want to do. And we'll, we'll look at this uh, tonight and we'll do a quick review before we do. We'll just, we'll just review the book quickly. Acts chapter 1, if you recall, we have the, uh, we have the precursor to the day of Pentecost. We have essentially... The apostles are waiting in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father, Acts 1, 4, and 5, Acts 1, 8, reference John 14 through 16, um, and, and various other passages that we always relate to that. We know that they were waiting there, and they were waiting the promise of the Father, Luke 24. He would say, but tarry ye in Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. So they were waiting in Jerusalem for this promise, and they would know that Christ was at the right hand of God when they received this promise. And that's what they would receive in the very next chapter in Acts 2. On that day, uh, the day of Pentecost, as they were uh, endued with this power from on high, as they were clothed, as they were immersed in this power from the Holy Spirit, you have Peter preaching an inspired gospel, and he, he goes to Joel 2 to say this is, uh, this is the fulfillment of that prophecy. And you have him going to Psalm 16 and saying that Jesus Christ is him that was spoken of when he said, Thou shalt not leave my soul in hell, neither suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known unto me all the ways of life and shall make me full of joy with thy countenance. And he would say, Men and brethren, let me speak to you freely. The patriarch David, that he's both dead and buried, but therefore being a prophet, he spoke of Christ and his resurrection. So we have that David, uh, uh, David's psalm was uh, applied to Jesus and Peter made application of Christ and he simply preached that Jesus was the fulfillment of all the prophecies concerning the Messiah and you Jews crucified him. Very simple. Very effective. Men and brother, what shall we do? Say the sinner's prayer, right? No, it's not right. What must we do to be saved? Verse 37, what must we do? Men and brethren, what shall we do? Nothing, you're already saved or you're already lost. Nothing, is that what he says? Does he say, accept Jesus in your heart? Do backflips for Jesus. What does he say? Repent to be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Remember we talked about that this morning, that thief. Two thieves on the cross. There are two thieves, weren't there? Last time I checked, there were two thieves. One's pretty famous, one isn't. And one's famous for all the wrong reasons. They don't even know what they're talking about. But the less famous thief on the cross, he was hanging right there on the other side of Jesus and he was feet away from eternity, feet away from eternal life, being so close yet so far away. And had he known what Peter would preach in Acts chapter 4, that this is the builder, this is, uh, this is the stone that was rejected of you builders, but he has made the head of the corner and he would say that in him, that is, there is no other name given under heaven among men whereby you must be saved. There is no saving authority but that of Christ. And that thief was right beside him. What a tragic mistake. So when we're talking about the authority of Christ, that's what he preached. He preached, Peter preached, that there is salvation only in Christ and here's how you benefit from him. You do what he told you, he told you to do. That's to call on the name of the Lord, Acts 2.21. All right, chapter 3. The gospel goes to the temple. The church goes to the temple first. The gospel is to go to the Jews first, right? We said the first several years, you have a, the gospel being a Jewish gospel, and when we see the events in Acts 6, you see that the, it's still a church in Jerusalem. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a Jewish audience, right? That, that's what we have. It was made up of these uh, people from, uh, from this nation. Uh, so he goes to the Jews first, and he heals the man. 
And you see the, the events of chapter 4 are essentially the exact same time as chapter 3. And you have the opposition that they would face in chapter 4 because of the events of chapter 3. And you have this persecution coming against these inspired men already. And we're going to see it throughout the book of Acts. And not only are we going to see it throughout the book of Acts, we're going to see it in the epistles that Paul would write later. And even the epistles Peter would write. Peter writes about that in 1 Peter chapter 4. He would say that these individuals uh, were going to face very fierce persecution. This judgment, remember beginning verse 12 all the way through verse 17 in chapter 4. He talks about this fiery trial. He talks about all of these ideas that, would, that are fulfilled uh, or, or that would come about because of the persecution that these Christians were facing. So it isn't anything new. When we read the New Testament, we read a book of, of intense persecution against these, these Christians. Acts chapter 5, we see the inner workings of the church. We see the death of Ananias and Sapphira and the miraculous activity going on in that chapter. And yet again, what do they face? Because of doing good, persecution. Acts chapter 6, <clears throat> we now have the, uh, a, a close look at the church in Jerusalem. And you have the, uh, the daily ministration, that is the, the, the feeding of the people of this congregation. That apparently some of the, uh, the Grecians had, had supposed that the Hebrews were neglecting their widows. And so they wanted something done about it, which of course was totally fine. The apostles did something about it. They told them to look out among themselves, seven men that met these qualifications and they were to be appointed over this business. And one of these men is the focal point now and will be the focal point of the very next chapter also. And the reason why he's the focal point is because his persecution and his effective preaching was so powerful that they would stone him for it. And that would bring about then even more intense persecution, which would scatter the church abroad and bring the church now or the gospel into Samaria and into the world of the Gentiles. That's the significance of it. All right. So chapter six, beginning in verse eight, it says, And Stephen, being full of faith and power, did great works and, and wonders or wonders and miracles, excuse me, among the people. Verse 9, then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians and of them of Sicilia and Asia disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and spirit by which he spake. We said that verses uh, six, or excuse me, verse 8 and 10 are synonymous. Being full of faith and power is to be full of wisdom and the spirit. It's the same, same idea. Um, we're talking about an inspired preacher that they simply could not answer. And last week we even discussed that. If you've ever seen really good preachers, if you've seen uh, a, a Bible discussion or a debate with somebody who really knows his stuff, you can't answer it, can you? He's got an answer for everything. All the opposition and the errors that the denominational folks bring, truth answers it, right? And that's the way that it ought to be, and that's exactly how it was with Stephen. Verse 11 says, And they suborned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses, and against God. All right, so let's look at this. <clears throat> the word suborned, uh, suborned means underhanded. Thayer would say to throw or put under, to suggest to the mind, to instruct privately, instigate, bribe or induce, unlawfully or secretly to perform some misdeed or definition number four simply is to induce a person or a witness to give false testimony. That's the idea. <clears throat> <clears throat> so it says when these Jews would suborn men, that is, they are trying to get them to bring about some kind of a false witness, just as they did to Christ. You remember they said the same thing of Christ. They brought together all the witnesses, and none of them agreed together, right? You had some basic comprehension of what he, of what he had said, but it was misapplied. One of them said that, well, this man said that he would destroy the temple and build it again in three days. And of course, they really took off on that, didn't they? Carnally thinking Jews, thinking of Herod's temple when Jesus was talking about his body. And he would say, well, it was, it was 46 years in building and you'll build it again in three days. But it says their witness agreed not together. So you see that they did hear some of what Jesus said concerning him dying and, and rising again on the third day, but they misapplied it and therefore they brought a false witness. And you have the same thing here. You have them that are actually, they're bringing up some points that I'm absolutely certain Stephen brought up. We're going to look at some of those points. But of course, the entire point of this was they were doing so in a malicious way <clears throat> and they were, uh, they were trying to, to bear some kind of a false witness to accuse Stephen. All right. So when it says he spoke blasphemous words against Moses, notice that the word Moses is used representing something else. Did he read a, uh, did he speak blasphemous? Did he just keep saying Moses over and over and, and, and actually speak against Moses? Or did he speak against the instructions or the law that Moses gave? He spoke against the law that Moses gave. 
So Moses is used here as a figure of speech. You could understand it as being a synecdoche or a metonymy, whatever it is, that's totally fine. That which stands for another, that's the idea. When it says Moses, it is speaking of the law of Moses, okay? I'll give you three or four examples. Acts 15, 21. It says, For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him. What were they preaching in these synagogues? The law of Moses. So when they preached the law of Moses, they were preaching Moses, right? That's, that's the idea. That's, why, that's how it's used in that representative form. <clears> 2 <throat> Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Now, was Moses abolished? Or was the law abolished? But their minds were blinded, for unto this day remaineth the same veil taken away in the reading of the Old Testament. Notice the synonymous use of Moses in the Old Testament. Which veil is done away in Christ. But listen to verse 15. But even unto this day when Moses is read. That which Moses wrote. That which Moses revealed. That which is associated with Moses. Which is the law of Moses. Right? That's what we're talking about. <clears throat> now notice that when it says. Uh, they said that they spake blasphemous words against Moses. And against God. It was said to be blasphemous against God because God is the one who gave it to Moses in the first place. Mm -hmm. Right? That's the idea. Now we said that this is, a, this is an accusation. This is a, 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 an actual a false accusation. But there is validity to the accusation itself as far as how it's put together. To speak against Moses was to speak against God. Right? That's, that's fine. It's just Stephen wasn't speaking against a law that was still intact and fully approved of by God. Stephen was speaking against an abolished law. That God himself did away with. As do all the other New Testament preachers. I want you to notice the phrase, the law of God. All right, In Joshua 24 and verse 26, it says, And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. Whose law was it? It's the law of God, it says right there. It was in the book of the law of God. All right, Nehemiah 10, 28. And the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, uh, the Nathanims, and all that separated themselves from the people of the lands unto the law of God. What'd they do? They actually heeded the law of God. Well, what was the law of God that Nehemiah had? What was the law of God that Joshua had? If you want to, you can turn in your Bibles for just a moment to Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8, maybe it's the case that you've had a discussion with a Seventh-day Adventist or you've uh, come across somebody that believes that the law of Moses is distinct from the law of God because that's one of the arguments that they make. They say that the law of God supersedes the law of Moses. The law of God was eternal and the law of Moses just dealt with the ceremonial aspects of the law. But the law of God is the Ten Commandments that is eternal according to them. But I want you to notice something. In Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 1, it says, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book, listen to this, of the law of Moses. Now look at Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 8. So they read in the book of the law of God. Distinctly. Verse 1, it was called the law of Moses. Verse 8, it's called the law of God. Verse 18 says, And also day by day, from the first day into the last day, he read in the book of the law of God. Who's, whose book was it? Whose law was it? Well, ultimately, it was God's law, wasn't it? But God gave it to Moses, and they're the same thing. So there is no distinction between God's law and Moses' law. They were used interchangeably at that time. And God absolutely did abrogate or do away with that law. He did. To institute another more superior law. So when it says they spake blasphemous things against Moses, we understand what we're talking about. And when they spake blasphemous things against God, you understand the implication of if God approved of Moses and told him to write what he did, if you speak against Moses, you speak against God, right? That's the idea. And that's valid. Just like Christ. Christ appears to, to Paul on the road to Damascus, or Saul at this time. And he says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Well, uh, 
I don't think that there's a, a being, a human being out there that can show me in the Bible where Paul ever personally, we have any record of Paul meeting Jesus face to face before his death, let alone persecuting him. But what we do have record of is Paul in Acts 9, 22 and 26, Paul is taking Christians and he is coming with letters and he is going to Damascus to, to persecute Christians. And when he persecuted Christians, which are the body, he persecuted Christ, which is the head. So we understand all of that. Now we said that the accusation in and of itself was deceitful. But the accusations are understandable in light of what inspired men taught about the law. Now I'm not sure, but I think in the outline, the rest of the, the, the lesson is going to focus on this. And that is that they were right to, to say, and again, you'll see these accusations uh, when Paul writes or when Paul preaches, you'll see accusations similar. You'll see as we continue in the book of Acts, that there are similar complaints that are uh, given against these preachers and they all have to do with what? Doing away with the law. Isn't it interesting that that's a consistent theme? You have James in, in Acts 21 who would uh, tell Paul that, uh, that uh, these uh, Jewish brethren uh, had the idea that Paul wasn't keeping the customs of the law. And you have a lot of folks, and I've even been on both sides of that, but, and, and if anyone knows what I'm talking about, the account, you know what I'm talking about. Kind of a difficult account, right? A lot of folks think, and I even said at one time, I think James was just dead wrong. <clears throat> but I've revised my view since then, and we've studied that. I don't believe it was the fact that James is wrong. I just think that we misunderstand what James meant. In that context, he, he knows that Paul is there, and Paul comes to James and the apostles, and, and James tells Paul, hey, we've heard uh, that you're telling the Jews, the Jewish brethren, to forsake Moses and the law, but in the very next verse, he says to keep the customs. Now, James wrote in James chapter 2 that if you're going to be under the law, you've got to, you're bound to keep every bit of it, and if you fail in one aspect, you're guilty of it. But James also would say in James 1.25 and 2.12 that we're not accountable to that law anymore, but we're accountable to a law of liberty. So I don't believe that James spoke out of one side of his mouth saying we're free from the law, we're bound to the gospel, and then on the other side telling Paul, hey, we're still bound to the law. He was talking about the customs, and he was talking about keeping them as an expedient. So that Paul, and Paul was happy to do so, because Paul would say very clearly that unto the Jews I am a Jew, and unto the Gentiles I am a Gentile, right? I'm whatever you want me to be as long as I can win you to Christ. <clears throat> because Paul understood that the law of Moses was not binding upon him, and he did not have to keep these aspects of it, but there was certainly nothing wrong with keeping them as an expediency to make sure that you were a good example to the Jews. And so we have... Uh, the, the very clear picture painted in the book of Acts that the law of Moses was done away with. And the gospel is completely different than the law. We'll give you some examples. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, we'll look at three verses here and we'll see some very interesting wording and we'll even see the implication because uh, Paul, the wording that he uses deals with marriage. Romans 7, 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Now, what were they to the law? Dead to the law. What does James say about death in James 2, 26? For as the, uh, uh, the soul or the spirit without the body is dead, so is faith without works. When we're talking about death, we're talking about separation. Paul says you're separate from the law by the body of Christ. Right? <clears throat> Look at verse 6. But now we are delivered from the law. <clears throat> Dead to the law, verse 4, delivered from the law, verse 6. What does that mean? You're not, a, you're not amenable to the law. And he uses it in the context of marriage because he says, <clears throat> as the husband is bound to the wife, as long as, or the wife is bound to the husband as long as the, the husband lives, what happens if the husband dies? Well, she is now free from that. Death sunders that bond, and she is now free to marry another. And he says, so are you who were bound to the law. The law's dead. Now you're free to marry Christ. All right, that's what he says. Now, is that what they said in this accusation, essentially? That he spake blasphemous things against Moses and God. Well, if you want to say doing away with the law is blasphemous according to Moses, that's fine because that's true. Doing away with the law is a reality. It was done away with. <clears throat> what about Peter? Peter? 
Acts chapter 10, didn't Peter say that I have never eaten anything unclean? Yeah, he did say that in the context of that vision, didn't he? As he was there in Joppa and he was waiting for Cornelius' men to come uh, and fetch him and he was in that trance and he saw those beasts and God says, rise, kill, uh, rise Peter, kill and eat. And he says, not so, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. What does God say? Call not thou unclean what I've cleansed. Number one, he says that, and we talked about that not too long ago, that how, how could God have even said that in the context of accepting Gentiles if the dietary laws of the, of the law weren't in fact done away with? But point number two, some would argue that Peter still kept the law, but we remember what Paul said. We looked at this too just the other day. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11, as Paul rebukes Peter for his racism, he would also say in that very same context, if thou being a Jew compellest uh, the Gentiles to live as do the Jews, but you yourself live as a Gentile, why are you trying to get the Gentiles to live as the Jews? What did Paul say about Peter? He said, you claim to be a Jew, but you don't live like one. Peter wasn't keeping the law, according to Paul, by inspiration. Could Peter have kept the dietary aspects of the law as an expediency or as a custom? Yes, absolutely. There's no problem with that. But he knew they were not binding upon him, right? He knew that, as did James and as did Paul. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 19, we know that what, uh, what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. I remember talking to <clears throat> those Mormons when I had those three studies with them. And they believe in baptism by proxy. In other words, uh, they believe 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 26 dealing with baptism for the dead. They believe that that means that uh, if your dead relative uh, has never obeyed the gospel, never been baptized, that they can be baptized on behalf of them and that will get them into heaven. And they said even Abraham needed this. And I asked them where was the obligation for Abraham to be baptized. And they couldn't find it, but they would go to Acts 2 and verse 38. They didn't understand this principle, did they? Abraham died 2,000 years before Pentecost. What, is, what does that have to do with Abraham? Nothing. I'm not amenable to the laws of Germany. Abraham wasn't amenable to the New Testament system. The New Testament wasn't in effect. Whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all may stand guilty before God. The law was given so that man would understand his frailty and his need for God. But the only thing that it speaks to, the law speaks to, is individuals that are accountable to it. So we need to understand that, right? That uh, we are accountable to the gospel. There's not a human being here that needs to observe the Sabbath. Not a human being that's been alive for almost 2,000 years that has an obligation to observe the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath wasn't for you. It never was intended for you. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Why? For by the law is knowledge of sin. When you have a standard to keep and you fail to keep it, that standard doesn't offer you a way out, does it? All it does is condemn you. But the gospel offers a way out. But now the righteousness of God, that's the gospel, without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Christ unto all and upon all that believe, that there are, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Notice verse 24. Being justified freely by the grace that is uh, through the redemption that is in Christ. Notice the distinction. No flesh justified under the law. Verse 20. Justified freely in Christ. Verse 24. Is there not a contrast between the law and the gospel? Are they not two distinct separate things? And is not the law dead and replaced and abrogated by the gospel? Yes. The AD 70 folks would tell you that they're a parallel system and they ran parallel for 40 years between AD 30 and AD 70. And they will say that in actuality, the gospel is the resurrected law, essentially. They keep changing their mind between the, the resurrection, whether it's baptism or whether it's already happened or whether it's actually a spiritual glorification or whether it's on earth. Matthew 5, 12, I've heard them say, Blah, great is your reward in heaven. And William Bell said he's enjoying it right now. Which means he's in heaven right now. Out of his mouth. But they understand or they don't understand in, in actuality that the law didn't end uh, when Titus came and destroyed Jerusalem. The law ended when Christ died and instituted a new covenant. That's when it ended. Matthew, excuse me, Romans 10 beginning in verse 1. 
Notice that what the law couldn't do, the gospel did. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Why, why did Paul write that? Did, was Paul wrong? Anybody? Raise your hand. You think Paul was wrong? You know, all the people today think the, the, the actual nation over there in Palestine are God's chosen people. Isn't that what they say? Yeah, you know, as a matter of fact, the Zionist concept is why we have always been military allies with Israel. You know that, right? Because of the denominational concept of these, these people in high places who thought, hey, we've got to be on Israel's side. Which, by the way, I don't necessarily think that's a bad idea as far as these being pretty decent folks. But what I'm saying is that they totally missed it. For the last 2,000 years, God has not had a physical nation. He's had a spiritual kingdom. And Galatians 6.16 says, Blessed be the Israel of God, which is the church of Christ. Verse 2, For I bear them a record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. What is that? Was What is God's righteousness in the book of Romans again? It's the gospel of Jesus. They being ignorant of the gospel and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. What the gospel does, the law could not. Second Corinthians chapter 3. Notice the contrast between the two. We want to make sure we understand this is not some kind of a remake. This is not, as some of our own brethren are teaching, some ridiculous concept of a renovated earth. What are you talking about? Quickly, there's four times that the phrase new heavens and earth is used. Isaiah 65, Isaiah 66, 2 Peter chapter 3, and the book of Revelation in verse 21, chapter 21. Four times, and they make an entire doctrine out of it. And they try to tell you that God isn't actually going to destroy the earth. He's going to renovate it. And who knows where heaven will be now. Now we're getting into Jehovah Witness stuff. Now we're getting into the Mormons. You know, the Mormons told me that I don't get to go to heaven. I don't get to have my own planet, but I'll be saved here on earth. I get the kind of the, the second rate stuff. Where does it end? Whenever, whenever I get to decide what goes, where does it end? But when God gets to decide, that's pretty easy, isn't it? So the, the gospel isn't some renovated law of Moses. The law of Moses was removed, done, is done. The gospel is a new and distinct system, right? But who hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit, for the letter kills and the spirit gives life. But if the ministration of death, that's the law of Moses. 2 Corinthians 3, 7. Tell me that's not the law of Moses. If it's not the law of Moses, what is the ministration of death? What is it? Romans 8 and, and chapter, uh, chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them in Christ who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. He says, for the law of the life and spirit of Christ hath made me free from the law of sin and death. What is the law of sin and death in Romans 8, 2 if it's not the law of Moses? What is it? What did the law of Moses bring? Death. Why? Because it exposed sin. That's all. It's simple. That's what he says. He says the ministration of death. What is that? Listen. Written and engraven in stones. What was written in the stone? Exodus chapter 19. What was written in stone? The law of Moses. The Decalogue. The Ten Commandments. If it was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? If the ministration of condemnation, what's that? That's the law, was glory. How much more the ministration of righteousness shall exceed in glory? For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect. Verse, verse 11, for if that which is done away was glorious... <clears throat> Much more that which remains is glorious. Do you hear that contrast? Do you hear all the descriptive terms Paul used concerning the law and its temporal, carnal nature and what it actually produced compared to the gospel? <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances which was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or the Sabbath or of the new moon, which were a shadow of things to come. But the body, or that word is substance, is Christ. <clears throat> so the law, the ordinances, the Sabbaths, all of this was a shadow 
that Christ cast with his body, his substance. And of course, that is the realization of this in, in the church. The law was a shadow of the gospel. The law of Moses and all the tabernacle and all the service was a shadow of the good things to come. And that's what he says. And he very clearly says that the law was nailed to the cross. Kind of hard to argue with that one, isn't it? What these folks were ignorant of is that God is the one that did away with the law in the first place. Ephesians 2 and verse 11, Wherefore remember that ye being in the times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made with hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens of the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ, ye who are sometimes far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Verse 14, for he is our peace, who hath made both one. Both what? Jew and Gentile. Both classes of people. There are only two classes of people, biblically speaking, in these terms. Jews and non-Jews. Right? That's it. He is our peace who hath made one, both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain, that's two, one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So do you understand that maybe these guys did hear some of the truth? You know what? Stephen probably preached that the law was done and the gospel was in effect. Just like every other inspired man preached. But these men would bring an accusation against him. And they would bring false witnesses. But they could not withstand the truth that old Stephen was preaching. I'd like to extend the invitation at this time. Are there any here tonight that have never obeyed the gospel? If you've never obeyed, you must hear the word of God and believe it. Repent of your sins. Uh, John, uh, excuse me, Matthew 12, 41. Remember, we talked about that. If you want to know, well, I don't understand repentance. Go read Jonah 3, 5 through 10. Read Jonah 3, 5 through 10, and then reference Matthew 12, 41. Jesus said that they repented at or into the preaching of Jonah. And if you do what the Ninevites did, then you'll do what Jesus said is repentance. And that's a pretty good idea. Just change your mind, change your actions. Acts 17 and verse 30. Re repent, you must. Uh, acknowledge your faith in Christ, Romans 10, 10. And be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. And those who do so are added to the only church, and you're part of the saved wherein are all spiritual blessings, Ephesians 1, 3 through 7. Remain faithful. Continue in your uh, continue in Christ. Christ. John uh, chapter 8, verse 31 and 32 says, If you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed. 2 John 9, we must abide in the doctrine of Christ. 1 John 1, we must walk in the light. 1 John 2, we must walk in his commandments. 1 John 3, we must do right. That's the idea. Those who have not... Continue to walk in faithfulness. If you have obeyed the gospel and you are unfaithful, come on back. Repent. Acknowledge your sin and prayer to God. He'll forgive you. If he needs to pray for you, we will. The invitation is yours. Please come now as we stand and sing.